last week I talked about a story from the life of Moses, and I want to follow up with another one today because there's a lot of truth in this story, and it helps us to deal with uh, the principles I want to talk about today will help us deal with whatever issues might be going on in our life in a very practical, meaningful way. It's important for us to think about our spiritual process or the our interest in spiritual things and keep a perspective because we don't want to just see the whole thing as a problem-solving activity where we're going along in our life and we have problems crop up as we all do and we call upon our spiritual principles that we have picked up to solve those problems. And once the problems are solved, we can move on with our experience in a more peaceful manner. What we are doing is responding to something in us that is greater than what we have expressed up to this point. We're all on the spiritual path. We're all interested in spiritual things because something is saying come up higher something in us is saying come up higher and the story we want to talk about today is uh, Israel coming out of the bondage of Egypt and this story is about us it's about us solving a problem the problem is bondage to some Egypt to some situation we might be in but as I pointed out last week what the nation of Israel discovered was once they solved the problem of becoming free from Egyptians uh, the bondage of the Egyptians the condition of slavery they were immediately confronted with other challenges and the first challenge they were confronted with was a pretty big one, and that's one we're going to talk about today. And that is the confrontation with the Red Sea. Actually, the Israelites were leaving Egypt after a long process of uh, dealing with a Pharaoh who, who would agree, then he would change his mind and all of that. And finally, he agreed because he was suffering as a result of some of the uh, problems that came about by holding them captive, holding the Is Israelites captive. So we finally gave in and let them go. And they were all just totally thrilled. They were going out into the desert away from uh, their captors and Pharaoh changed his mind. Again, this time he decided to go out and just eliminate them, uh, to slaughter them. So the Israelites were faced with that problem. They could hear the thundering hoofbeats in the distance and they had no place to go because they were up against the Red Sea. And so that's the, the condition that we find uh, this story is in, it takes place. And all of us have been in this kind of place. We might be in this place right now we would say it's we're between a rock and a hard place. We don't know which way to turn. Behind us, we have this thundering Egyptian army, and ahead of us, we have a, an impassable barrier. So it doesn't look like we have any options. And so our first reaction is to express fear, terror. You know, in their case, it was terror, and you can imagine. I think we could all sympathize with that. In, a, in an actual situation like that, it would be pretty horrific. But if we just think of our own life, you know, we have all been in a place where we've said, I don't know what to do about this. I've got a problem here and I don't know what to do. So that's kind of how we approach it. But what we want to keep in mind is we're going to solve this problem. We're going to resolve it. And we're going to talk about ways, uh, three principles that we can apply to any situation that will help us to do that. We have the faculties... Um, that will allow us to rise above the thing that we're involved in and get a perspective that will allow us to solve the problem. 
So the problem will be solved, if not today, if not tomorrow, maybe next week, maybe next month. But it will be solved, and it will be forgotten, pretty much. So that's not why we want to develop a spiritual awareness. That's not why we study. That's not why we ask for guidance. We want to know who we are. We want to know who it is that is doing this running, that is having these problems. We want to know the truth about our spiritual nature, the truth about ourselves, to the point where next time we're between a rock and a hard place, and we will be, there will be a next time, we won't freak out so bad. You know, we'll, we'll realize that we have the power here now, and if we'll bring our awareness to this now moment again, then we will be able to apply what we know to, to deal with it in a way that peace is restored to our daily experience. And the daily experience is all we have. If our peace is destroyed today, it's our life is ruined pretty much because this is the only day we have. This is the time we have is now. So we want to learn to, to get a, a, a higher perspective and to not just use spiritual principles to solve problems, but to connect with our, with our power. So here the Israelites were out, and they were um, between this rock and a hard place. They were terrorized, terrified, that the Egyptians were going to slaughter them, and they had no way out. So Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. What this is actually is a formula. And we see it several times in the Old Testament and in some other versions of it in the New Testament. But the command to fear not is used, I don't know, I printed on the back of the program 22 times or something like that through the Bible. It's a command, it's a, it's a principle, fear not. And it sounds like, well, how could that be a principle, fear not? It's a, it's a command, but it doesn't mean the problem's going to go away. So what does it mean? So it's a very important idea, it's a principle, and it involves some of, our, some of our spiritual faculties, all three of these things, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord. It's something that we can apply, you know, think about if you're going through something at this moment, how you can apply that to, to the, this situation. So we start with the first idea, fear not. Fear is an emotion. It's an emotion based on some appearance. And usually it is based on the belief that the thing that we are looking at, the thing that is the problem in our life is greater than our resources, greater than what we have at hand. And that's why we express fear. Because I don't have what it takes to deal with this thing. So my reaction is fear. I am smaller than this thing. But the command is to stop doing that. To stop letting that emotion rule. Is that possible without getting rid of the, the problem? And that's where the spiritual understanding comes in. So we get control of our emotions. Fear squelches the creative imagination is, is by far the most unproductive, debilitating emotion we can harbor. We all know that, of course. When you are totally consumed with a problem, when we are totally consumed with the problem, we tend to lose our creativity. Why is that? You know, we lose our objectivity. We lose uh, the sense that something greater might be unfolding through this whole thing. We lose that because we shut it down. The fear, the emotion of fear shuts it down. It doesn't, we don't lose it, but we redirect our awareness in a way that 
shuts down all of our creative imagination. So we're looking here at two faculties that we all possess, the faculty of will and the faculty of elimination. The faculty of will is that faculty we have that we say, I will not let the emotion of fear rule me. I do have something to say about this. We step back and we release that emotion of fear. We will ourselves to do that. We must be willing to do that first. But the, the faculty of will is very important in this regard. What most of us will say is I will stop fearing the moment the thing disappears, the moment the problem is resolved, and that's true, we will. But what if it doesn't resolve? What if it's not resolved right now? What do we do with that? We have to take a look at what we're doing at the emotional level, letting our fears run wild. And we may have to assert ourselves a little to say, stop doing that. I will not allow myself, my emotions, to go down that road. I pull back. I pull back my emotions. I release all fear at this moment. You can imagine the Israelites in their situation would have seemed like a totally immediate problem that needed to be solved. And part of the, the value of these stories is that they are so intense. You know, it makes your problem look pretty small when you think about it, <laughs> whatever that problem is. So if they can do it, surely I can do it. So look at yourself right now. Just think of if you're, if you're involved in something that is uh, bothering you, and maybe that's all it is, it's bothering you. That's your Egyptians. It's not life-threatening or anything. But you're letting that drain you. You are allowing your energies to flow into that thing that bothers you. So that reduces the creative abilities that closes the mind down to that little segment of your life that will surely come to pass. But fear not is, it's a command, but it's a principle. Like you don't have to fear. You don't have to react in fear. That's what it's saying. If you're afraid and somebody says fear not, they're giving you an option. You don't have to do that. But we have thought we did have to do that because the circumstance obviously calls for it. But we don't really resolve things from that level. And I'm not talking about the kind of fear that if you're out camping someplace and a grizzly bear wanders into your camp, you know, that's, that's a whole different kind of fear. The bear that I'm talking about is the kind that lives under your bed, you know, when you're like five years old. I used to be afraid of that bear until I got older and I started thinking, you know, how could a bear fit under my bed? And what would a bear have to go through to get under my bed? <laughs> my mother would have discovered the bear, you know, sometime during the day. But when you're young and you're, it's dark and you're lying in bed thinking about bears. We used to beg my father to tell us bear stories before bedtime. And he actually would get his guitar and sing bear songs and just totally terrorize us. And if he'd quit, we'd beg him to keep going. And, but I have never once had a bear in my room under my bed. And just to think of the logistics, but your mind doesn't go there when you're afraid. It's very possible for a bear, a very ugly bear, to be under your bed in your house. And there aren't, any, aren't even any bears around, out in, even in the woods. Now, when we lived in Evergreen, there were several cases where someone would come home and there would be a bear asleep on the couch. <laughs> that happened several times when we were there. There would be bear attacks within a house. So it's not totally unjustified worrying about a bear, but 
You see what I'm saying? There's two kinds of fear. One is that your imagination is running wild and it's just debilitating. The other is kind of a self-preservation. You naturally want to run from a bear, or not necessarily run from a bear, but do whatever you have to do to deal with a bear. We're not in that situation very often. We're a lot more familiar with the mental bears than we are the actual. So what happens when we are afraid is we lose all creativity. Like if I'd be lying in bed as a kid thinking about a bear under my bed, my imagination would be very functional, but it would be sh shooting off in the wrong direction, a direction that was robbing me of peace. I was, would not be able to engage logic. It's not possible for a bear to be in my room. Because when you're afraid, it is possible. The bear doesn't have to go through all those obstacles because it's a mental thing and you're reacting to it at an emotional level, making it a very real thing. So in a case like that, as a kid, and I never did this, but the smart thing to do would be get up, turn the light on, look under the bed, make sure there's no bear, and go back to sleep. That would be the logical, rational thing to do. So that's what we're saying, let's do this. We've got this emotion of fear. We're worried about something. We want to turn on the light in our own thinking and say that I am an expression of one presence and one power. And that one presence and one power is greater than that which is in this world. It's greater than this problem. And it begins to diminish the emotional grip we have on the thing in a way that allows us to start being a little bit more creative. What if this thing was gone? It's kind of hard to, to think that when you're in the middle of something, but there comes a time when you do start thinking that. You're able to get past. And that's when the light begins to dawn. So we can actually will ourselves into that. And we have to start by understanding that, like, who's in charge of our emotions? And I have to say the only person on the planet that's in charge of my emotions is me. I may say, you make me angry, but you don't make me angry. I choose to be angry by whatever you do. To react in anger, I choose to do that or I choose not to do it. But I do have that ability. So when Moses says, fear not, he's not saying, do something you can't do. Do the impossible. He's saying, here's something you can do, so do it. Pull your energy out of the fear. Pull your energy out of all of the scenarios you're running about how that bear's going to get you, you know, the, the problems you're going to have with this. So what is the faculty of elimination? That's that part of us that is able to let go. It's that thought of climbing a ladder. You know, you let go of one rung so you can grab onto the next one. It's moving forward in that way. The letting go is not irresponsible. It's a letting go of the emotion. I let go of the emotion of fear. I choose to release this emotion of fear. And you don't have to you know, do all this self-talk necessarily, although it might help. But if you have a problem, you look at yourself, how you're behaving, you're, you'll see your emotion is totally tied up in that. So we want to release that because that is a very important part of our energy level, our creative energy. To stand firm. To stand firm means to center yourself in the idea that greater good is working out through this situation. That's not easy to do sometimes. It deals with the faculty of faith. And I've said faith is like a telescope. You can point it up to the stars or you can point it to the ground. There's nothing wrong with the faculty. It's the direction it's pointed. That's what matters. So. If you're saying, God, give me more faith, God will be saying, I have given you all the faith I can possibly give you. 
What are you doing with it? Which direction do you have it pointed? So Moses is saying, let's point our faith to the stars. Let's open up ourselves to greater possibilities. And again, the story is so extreme, you can imagine what all the Israelites would be thinking. What possibilities? <laughs> There's only one possibility. And it's not a good, going to be a good day for us. But there was another possibility, one that they didn't even think about. So where is our faith? Do we get ourselves, we, can we get ourselves back into this idea that my faith is in greater good unfolding through this situation now? When was the last time I thought that? Can I get myself back there? And the answer is yes. Because I'm being given the instruction to stand firm. To stand firm is in what do you believe? Do you believe in one presence and one power? Do you believe in the absolute good is unfolding through you now? Or is this just a window dressing? I think we all have absolute faith or faith in the absolute good. But we lose that. It wavers. Our faith wavers. You know, in the Bible, Peter represents, the, the, the apostle Peter represents faith. And we might wonder why he would represent faith because his faith wavered so much. Jesus appeared, you know, walking on water and invited Peter to step out of the boat. And I think Peter took one step, and the second step, he went under. But one step's not too bad. How many times have you walked on water? <laughs> I haven't walked, taken one step on water unless it was frozen. But Peter swore he would never abandon Jesus. Jesus said, yeah, you will. Before the cock crows three times, you'll deny that you even know me. And our faith does that. We feel very strong when things are going well. We feel our spiritual program is working quite well. But something pops up like we're dealing with at the moment, if, if we are dealing with something at the moment, and our faith kind of goes out the window. It telescope goes to the ground. So it's a reminder to stand firm, to focus your faith again in the greater good that's now unfolding. You've been here before. The greater good is now unfolding in my life. So we have this issue that's right there in front of us. You can't deny it. Can I hold that faith? Can I stand firm in the truth that greater good is now unfolding through my life? And I may not know what that greater good is. I may not have a clue as to how it could possibly unfold. But that's what faith is. If you could see it, you wouldn't have to have the faith. So Peter... <coughs> didn't know he would be confronted with such an extreme problem. And we don't usually either. Whatever problem we have, whatever thing comes up in our life, it's understandable that it becomes all-consuming because we really don't think we ought to be there. We don't want to be there. But we are there. So are we fearing? If we're fearing, then change that flow of energy. Fear not. Stand firm. Bring your power back into yourself. Point your telescope to the stars. See the salvation of the Lord. This is probably one of the most important of the three. Well, they're all three important. But you are to visualize a successful outcome and not necessarily the one that you think is best. Again, the story is uh, such a radical situation that the Israelites would never have thought the Red Sea would open up and allow them to, to go through. That would not ever have been a, a solution they would have come up with. So that's just a way of saying that this infinite intelligence 
knows more about what you need probably than you do. And that's not to say that we're ignorant, that we are less. It's just we're dealing with infinite intelligence compared to a mind that is shut down in fear. So we think all things are possible. We open ourselves up to this. But the idea of seeing the salvation of the Lord, okay, I don't know how the thing's going to work out, so how do I see the salvation of the Lord? You ask yourself how you would feel if it were resolved. That's how you start getting there. That's how you start seeing. And the seeing isn't necessarily visual, you know, something you see in your mind's eye, but it is part of the imagination. It's the, uh, the visualizing and the intuitive. It's more the intuitive if you can't see a picture. So that's the faculty we're using is the imagination. When you are fearing something, your imagination is functioning quite well. It's the bear under the bed. You can imagine exactly what that bear looks like, even though there's not a bear. You don't need a bear to be afraid of a bear. You don't really need the problem that you have to run this scenario through your mind and to use your imagination, to let your imagination run wild. And we do this. If we don't know what to do, we tend to run down the worst possible road in terms of how it's going to unfold. So Moses is saying here, see the salvation of the Lord. Take your, turn off the television, turn off the inner television in the sense of all the scenario, the negative scenarios you're running. See the salvation of the Lord is, how would I feel if this thing was resolved? How would I feel if this Red Sea opened up and I was free? Because he says, you'll never have to, the, the Egyptians you see here today, you'll never have to deal with again. How would you feel if this problem were permanently solved? That's what it's saying. That's getting our energies flowing in that direction. It's a very practical thing to do. Because there is but one presence and one power, and it's so easy to forget that. It looks like there's Egyptians, it looks like there's Red Seas, it looks like I made a big mistake, it looks like I shouldn't have listened to Moses. Who did I think I was to think I could possibly be free? I could stop making bricks for a living and do something that I wanted to do. Why would I have the audacity to think that? Whatever direction we set out in, we're going to con be confronted with challenges. And a challenge is simply an appearance that it seems to be larger than you are. But if you are a spiritual being, and if I am a spiritual being, then that means that's not true. Whatever that appearance is, whatever, however it appears, that which is in you is greater than that which is in the world. So what Moses is saying here, or what is said actually in several places throughout the Old Testament, is a formula that is absolutely true. It's based on absolute truth. Fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord. Fear not, get hold of your emotions. Stand firm, where's your faith pointed? see the salvation of the Lord what's going on in your mind can you grasp this idea that of how you would feel if this thing were resolved and we can you can do that practice applying these three simple instructions in any situation that arises and see how quickly those pursuing Egyptians become a non-issue all right very simple I bet you can all repeat those three things if I gave a test, which I'm not going to do. Your life is a test. Thank you for coming out, and we'll pick this up again next week.